Hello, I'm Tommy Moore from the Bartitsa Lab and in this video we're going to be looking at throwing mud in the machine. What I mean by throwing mud in the machine is that the brain is a computer and it's a really, really, really good computer and it solves problems very, very, very fast. Fighting is essentially a lot of high risk, high stakes, problem solving, decision making processes. And the more I can do to disrupt his decision making processes, the more successful I am more likely to be. Now, when we look at some of the staple techniques of, say, World War II combatives, one of the things I recommend is the notion of throwing mud in the machine. And what I mean often by that is when you disrupt things on a sensory level up top, when you mess with people's command center, their head, often all other systems and processes get delayed. The human body is very, very careful to protect the head. It wants the head to be safe. And essentially the general's view is the eyes. So when we talk about throwing mud in the machine, let's say I throw an initial lead hand blow here. Just a normal palm strike straight to the face. <coughs> I could retract this to fire something else. So I could, in essence, fire a one-two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, whatever I want to do. But if I maintain, after I strike, if I maintain a grip of this face, of hair, ear, beard, nose, mouth, eyes, if I treat this as a grippable object and I maintain that on there, I'm essentially throwing mud into his highly tuned machine. So as opposed to a percussive system of <coughs> I could, in fact, hit, maintain some degree of grip or indexing, move myself, and fire again. So I'll break that down a little bit more. Indexing is where the hand touches or has a notion of where the body is. So if I hit him and then put my hand here, I have some control of where he goes, what he does, but more importantly, I've got a bit of a, a guideline as to what I can hit, where I can go. So indexing is essentially making sure you can touch or subtly manipulate the opponent. It's a soft manipulation. If you wanted to escape from this, of course you could, you just need to step back. But the indexing is essentially, I know where he is, I know I can reach him because my hand's on him, I can do something else. So people that are very good at sucker punching will touch you on the shoulder, hit you in the face. Touch your arm, hit you in the face. Wave at you, hit you in the face. There, the indexing is both physical, but also psychological. I know you're in touching range and I'm manipulating you to some degree. The attachment is where I grab a chunk of clothing from any degree of grip, webbing, belt, rucksack, air, hair, eyes, ear, mouth, nose. So if we're looking at this initial strike here, I maintain an attachment or at least an index, so I'm grabbing a lump of face. Whether I get a full solid grip or whether I'm just touching it, it doesn't really matter. He has to deal with this. Now, people can deal with this relatively quickly, but it's thrown a bit of mud into his machine. So, I fired that tiger claw here. Now, like all good snipers, I've landed a shot. I need to reposition. Because his computer still knows that the person that was Tommy Moore is still here. Once I've done this, whilst this it disrupts his decision-making process, he can still lash out at me with his hands. But I essentially disrupt his OODA loop, disrupt his observation and orientation by moving offline and firing something else. So if you think of it very basically, it's the notion of maintaining sticky contact once you've hit, especially into the command center, to disrupt his ability to observe. He can't really see me or can't see me very well. And to orientate, it's hard for him to know where I am, especially if I obstruct and I reposition. So it's a good argument for keeping the hand in the face and on the space. Now people might say, oh, what if he bites you? What if he does this? In reality, this is half a second. <laughs> You've hit, you've maintained sticky contact, you've repositioned, and you've smashed. He doesn't really have a huge amount of time to react to you. And it's very hard for you to react when fingers are gripping and ripping into your face, your eyes, your ears. So if you treat the human face like a bowling ball, the first shot comes here, I maintain some indexing or attachment, depending on what you can get. Reposition, then fire. Reposition, then fire. Bear in mind the fire could be Strangle, could be push, it could be maintaining that sticky contact 
to draw and do something. So bear in mind that I'm disrupting his OODA loop here. I'm disrupting his vision, his balance. I'm causing some pain and injury, but I'm throwing muck into his machine. And when I move and reposition, it allows me to fire shots off a blind side. And the shot you didn't see coming is the one that puts you unconscious. So one of the main things I get guys used to when I'm training them is get used to firing ballistically and dynamically. <coughs> very, very important. But also to experiment with shots that maintain contact, <coughs> that maintain some pressure and contact to mess with their programming, to mess with their decision-making principles and programs. Very, very important. Another great reason is that if you think of low light, if you think of high adrenal shock, if you think of irritants in the eye, let's say you've been pepper sprayed, there's gas, there's fire, there's smoke, it's dark, whatever. My first strike, if it's something like an open palm, if I miss a little bit, it doesn't cause a huge amount of trauma to me. If I miss with a punch, it causes a lot of trauma to me. So it's a relatively low risk. But if I grab a lump of face, even if I can't see, even if my eyes are burning, even if it's very, very dark, as soon as I've got a lump of eyes and nose, I know where his body is and I know where I can move. So even if I'm not looking, can't see, have been sprayed, I've been punched in the nose and my eyes are watering, whatever that is, if I grab a lump of face, immediately, a bit like a blind judoka that has a grip given to them, immediately I can map out the rest of the environment where I am and where he is. So even without my eyes, I've still managed to observe and orientate. So even if it's dark, I've got adrenal stress, smoke or irritants, if I maintain that sticky contact, I then know exactly where he is for that millisecond it takes me to shuffle and smash, do something else. I can strike with safety and surety because I've maintained some attachment to that human being. So it's a very, very useful way to mix up your striking from ballistics into hit and stick, reposition, smash. There are pros and cons to both approaches, but both are very, very important to train. Being able to disrupt his OODA loop, disrupt his observation, disrupt his orientation, decide what I want to do, and smash. So I'm making my OODA loop very short because I've already decided what I can do because I know where his face is, and I've made his OODA loop very long because he's still stuck in those first two O's which allows me the time and ability to do something else. So those are some of the advantages of maintaining contact. And you'll see this in combat sports all the time. When guys are stiff arming, when they're pole jabbing like this, often this is an observation damaging. So he can't see, he's got this fist, it's waving in his face, it's pouring, it's stretching, it's extending, it's messing with his hooda loop, stopping him from observing and orientating so I can throw a bomb. So the exact same principle, say from a combat sport, and in this instance, with combatives thinking behind it, I've thrown some muck into the machine, giving me valuable milliseconds to do something else. Very, very important. So, experiment with maintaining contact, whether it's an index or an attachment. Practice not being able to see, especially if you've got a bob dummy, blindfold, put your hoodie down, whatever. Spin yourself, adrenalize yourself. Get used to the notion of, boom, I've got a lump of face. In this instance, I've got the side of the face. Now. Because we've got the side of the face, I know where the front of the face is, and I know where the back of the head is. So again, get used to not being able to see very well, launching something, then using that as your reference point to move off, do something else. Draw a weapon, escape, whatever it is. As soon as I've got that lump of face, I've landed the percussion of the shot. So the shot should be intended to cause damage. But also by maintaining some degree of indexing or attachment, I've mapped the geography of the scenario, I can mess with his decision making and hopefully land with something a bit more final. So those are some things to play with. 